Thank you for taking your time, though, today to attend today's webinar on syringe pump troubleshooting and maintenance. So let's get started. Topics discussed today will include how to maintain pump performance through routine maintenance and verification of operation, how to troubleshoot common problems, and some tips on how we can handle some fluids that create some challenges. My name is Mark Hansen, and I'm an electronic design engineer with over 25 years of experience with ISCO products. In my current role as senior applications engineer, I work with customers on how to use our syringe pumps in their applications. And now a few general words about Teledyne ISCO syringe pumps. As you are aware, syringe pumps are the best solution when you need a highly reliable, consistent, accurate pumping system. They are used in many different applications, not only in the laboratory, but also in pilot plants and even in production facilities. They are used to pump many different kinds of fluids and liquefied gases at varying densities. So let's take a detailed look at just how a pump works. A DC motor provides the drive for the system. The position and speed of this motor is reported to the controller by a quadrature type of optical sensor mounted on the rear of this motor. Each increment of revolution of this sensor represents a small but fixed amount of piston travel and therefore a known volume of fluid in the pump cylinder. The output speed of the motor is then reduced through a series of permanently lubricated gears and drives a worm gear screw combination. This worm gear is connected through a shear key to the ball screw. The ball nut contains a large number of ball bearings and translates this rotation of the ball screw into the linear motion that moves the piston up and down in the cylinder. A pair of optical limit sensors will detect when the piston reaches the end, either end of travel. Here's a blow up of the piston area showing the piston seal in purple. This seal has a built-in Hastelloy spring to help tension it against the side of the cylinder. The wear ring underneath this seal helps keep the piston centered. A second seal at the bottom is used to wipe down the cylinder wall. The integral pressure transducer in most pumps is sealed by using a gold-plated ring. Although many users never perform any routine maintenance on syringe pumps, those using pumps, particularly at or near their limits, may find performance increased by, by doing maintenance on a regular basis. So, just how often should this maintenance occur? Well, we recommend lubricating the pump and checking the brushes once a year or after about 6,000 pump strokes. Also, we recommend checking for leakage in the pump a minimum of once a year, but if you're running 24-7 or using a fluid that does create some problems, you may wish to check it more often. There is a procedure for this, which I'll go, across, go through later, which can also be found in Technical Bulletin 05. By the way, all these technical bulletins are available on our website, www.isco.com. So, to get back to pump maintenance, what are the three things I'm going to talk about today are, we're going to discuss pump lubrication, how to change the piston seal, and on how to change the motor brushes. So, in lubricating the pump, there are only two places that need to be lubricated regularly. And we mentioned earlier, to maximize pump life, it's good to do this about once a year or every 6,000 pump strokes. What do we need to do this? Well, basically a number two Phillips screwdriver, uh, a stick of some sort to apply the grease, and the two greases that came with your pump in its accessory package, the red Amosol grease and the black Never Seeds. So the first step is to run the pump cylinder until empty, and then to disconnect the power cord. Always be sure to disconnect the power from all your pumps before working on them. Then we need to loosen the four screws that hold the tower cover on, but we only need to loosen them about two turns each, as shown in these series of photos. Also, if you happen to have a set of air or electric valves, you may need to remove the screw that holds the valve bracket in place. After that, you can remove the two tower covers, as shown here, and from the pump so that you can gain access to the worm, uh, the ball screw. Then we need to remove the four screws that hold the case top on the pump module 
And again, these series of four photos shows the location of those being removed. And then we need to remove the cover by lifting up and sliding away from the tower. Once this is done, then we can use the red amosol grease and pour up a mount of it on top of the lubrication wheel as shown in this series of photos. The grease is then transferred to the worm gear as the pump runs, providing lubrication over a long period of time. After you've put the grease on top of the wheel, it will soak down into the fiber wheel as the pump runs. Note the amount of grease used as shown in this photo. If you happen to put too much grease on the pump, it will not do no harm, but it will tend to get all over the inside of the pump. Next, we'll grease the ball screw. We put a small amount of the grease, as shown here, on a stick or a, some type of thing so we don't have to get it on our fingers. And then we apply it evenly along the length of the ball screw. As the pump runs, it will distribute this grease uh, through the ball nut running up and down on the ball screw. So we don't have to be get this on precisely, but just kind of in generally spread over the length of the screw. Now we're ready to put the tower covers back on. Be sure you pay close attention as he did here to the hole in the top of the tower cover that aligns with the hole in the in the front of the pump tower. And then we replace the case top. The only thing to look watch out for here is there is one spot where the wires do run along the side of the pump, so you do want to make sure you don't accidentally pinch those as you put the case top on. So that's all there is to lubricating the pump. You put the screws back in, plug connections back into the power, and you're ready to go. There's only two places that need to be lubricated regularly, and this should be done probably about once a year or every 6,000 strokes. This is also detailed in technical bulletin number 22. Next, let's talk about seal replacement. The tools you'll need to accomplish this task are two Allen wrenches, one a quarter inch, one an eighth. The wrench kit for the pump to have is very handy. Although it can be done without it, it does make it much simpler. And also the never seize lubricant from the accessory package of the pump. So first, make sure you do have a correct seal in hand so that you do have the seal to put in it. As you know, the most pumps just come with a general graphite filled Teflon seal, but we do have high temperature seals, uh, seals for low pressure applications, a, an ultra high molecular weight polyethylene seal, and also a virgin uh, Teflon seal for specific uh, fluids. So again, the first thing we want to do is run the pump until it's empty. This is particularly important when you change the seal because this sets the, uh, that will help you set the dead volume in the pump when you put the cylinder back on. Then we want to remove the AC power cord. Also disconnect the pressure transducer plug from the rear of the pump module and then wrap up its cord at the top just to get it out of your way. Next we'll loosen the cylinder locking screw on the front of the tower about two turns with an eighth inch Allen wrench. If you happen to have an older pump, this uh, hole may not be there, so you may need to loosen the tower covers and remove those to gain access to the screw. Then you attach a cylinder clamp, tighten it with the quarter inch Allen wrench, and then loosen the cylinder with the pipe wrench. Pump, pipe, yes, the pipe wrench that came with the pump is the way to say that. And turning it counterclockwise, and then we're ready to pull the cylinder straight up to remove it. As it reaches the top, it will clear the top of the piston. Next, we use a quarter inch Allen wrench to remove the seal retainer and the seal from the piston. This is shown being unscrewed, and then you can then replace the seal with the spring facing towards the top. You do not want to handle the seal by the inner or outer edges so that you don't happen to damage any of the sealing surfaces. Press the new seal down over the piston retainer until it's flush. And now you're ready to put a little bit of never seize on the threads. This will help you the next time you need to take the pump apart to keep it from binding. Then we just screw it back on the top of the piston and tighten it to about 20 foot pounds with an Allen wrench. This is uh, not real tight, just tight enough so that it stays in place. Uh, 
if you over tighten this, then it becomes very difficult to get it off the next time you need to change the seal. Then at this point, it's a good idea to inspect the wiper seal, the lower wiper seal, and the wear ring. These normally do not need to be re ever replaced, but they could be cases where uh, they have been damaged. So if that's the case, you can refer to TB22 or the pump's instruction manuals for details on how to replace those two items. So now we're ready to slide the cylinder straight down onto, back onto the piston. And do be sure that you keep the piston vertical or the uh, cylinder vertical as you start this process so that you don't accidentally roll the edge of the, of the seal. So then we, after we put it down, we tighten it until we feel resistance or actually the bottoming out of the piston in the cylinder. And then we need to turn the uh, counterclockwise about a half to three quarters of a turn to align the cable with the back and provide the correct amount of dead volume in the pump. So once it's all put back together and in the proper place, you'll see the cable now comes out of the back of the pump. Then we need to tighten the cylinder retaining screw with the smaller eighth inch Allen wrench, reconnect the power and pressure transducer cords, connect back up your tubing, perform the leak test, which I'm going to go over here in just a moment, that's detailed in TB05. And to review this whole procedure, you can also see TB or technical bulletin number 22. So how do we perform a leak test? Well, after f putting fluid back into the pump and filling it up, it's best to uh, put the two plugs that came with the pump in. So this way we isolate the pump from any other components in the system. Then we put the pump in constant pressure mode, press the A key that's labeling the, the pressure label, and push C, soft key, for the maximum to set the pump to its maximum pressure and then we press the run key. First we allow the pump to come to pressure and sit for about 15 minutes to stabilize. After that we record the initial reading of the volume remaining in the cylinder. Then we let the pump sit for a minimum of 30 minutes and record a second reading of this volume. We can then use this to calculate the leakage rate by subtracting the final volume, the initial volume from the final volume and dividing by the amount of time that we let it sit in minutes. It's important to allow enough time here to accomplish this with having to worry about the changes in room temperature. So it's good to allow at least 30 minutes, oftentimes even longer is better. Again, this is detailed in Technical Bulletin 05, and also there are some additional verification tests that you can perform that are listed in this Technical Bulletin. Now we'll move on to motor brush inspection and replacement. Again, we had suggested that you inspect these brushes once every year or about every 6,000 pump strokes. Uh, both the upper and lower brush wear at about the same rate, so really all you have to do is look at the upper one to start with. If the lower, the lower brush is accessed, however, through an opening in the bottom of the pump, which we'll show a little later. So what tools do we need to perform this task? A 3 16th flat-bladed screwdriver, Again, a number two Phillips screwdriver and a pair of needle nose pliers is handy to have. The parts we'll be replacing are the brush and spring assemblies, and these are uh, ISCO part number 306 100 263, and you will need two of those. Again, as always, always remember to disconnect your pumps from AC power before you start or remove any covers from the pumps. And then we again remove the four screws that hold on the, the pump top cover and lift and slide that away from the tower. Then we remove the wire lead by pulling on the spade connector, which is pointed to by the yellow arrow here, and then unscrew the brush retainer from the motor using the straight edge screwdriver. Then we can pull the brush out of the slot and measure the length of it remaining. A new brush starts out at about 7 sixteenths of an inch or about 1.1 centimeters in length. If the brush happens to be getting near the minimum, which is 5 30 seconds or 0.4 centimeters, then it's a good time to replace it. If you do replace a brush, always be sure to replace both the upper and lower brush at the same time. So now to replace the brush, we'll either put the new brush or the existing brush back in the slot and then use a needle nose pliers to guide the spring and metal tabs back into the slot. Then holding on to that, we'll put the brush retainer and tighten it with that flat braided screwdriver. 
Again, this, these are plastic parts, so be careful not to over tighten them. And then we reconnect the spade lug motor lead that we disconnected earlier. So that's all it is to replacing the top brush. Now, to replace the bottom brush, we simply lay the pump on its side and remove the two screws that you see in the picture here that are covering the, up the lower brush. This allows us access to the lower brush, which is changed in exactly the same manner as we did the upper one. And when we're finished, then we simply replace the cover plate and put the case top back on the pump. Again, we do need to watch out for those wires that do run along the side of the pump and put the screws back in and we're good to go. You can also find details on how to do this procedure in technical bulletin number 22. Now we're going to take, spend a little time talking about how to troubleshoot some common problems that we may have with the pump. And we'll come up with some solutions and suggestions how to solve these. So the first thing is perhaps the power of the pump will not even power up. Uh, one of the first things to check, of course, is to make sure that AC power is actually being supplied to the pump. Uh, a quick plugging in of some other item into the power jack to make sure you are really getting power to the pump. Also be sure that the pump cable is actually a fully attached to the controller and to be sure that it's hooked to the pump A input. The pump controller does get all its power from the pump A, pump module. Also check to make sure that the power switch on each of the pump modules is on, as well as on the controller. And the final thing to check, if none of these seem to work, is to look into whether the pump A is actually supplying the 5 volts to the pump. And instructions on how to do this you can be found in the, in the pump's instruction manual. The next thing we want to look at is maybe the pump will power up, but it will not run or refill, and there are no error messages displayed on the controller. It may be possible if you do have a B or C pump that they're not getting their AC power, so be sure they're connected and also turned on. Also, uh, the software may have, if, if the software in the controller has recently been updated, uh, this may have been done without performing a controller reset. And the details on how to do this can be found in technical bulletin number nine. The other possibility is perhaps we've had a limit sensor failure, and instructions on how to solve that problem are also in, found in the instruction manual. Maybe your problem is that you can't set the pump to the pressure that you desire. Well, in one case, maybe you're trying to set a pressure that's higher than the pump will actually is capable of attaining, so you do need to check the instruction manual to make sure that you know the limit of the pump. Or the, you may have set a limit, or someone may have set a manual limit into the pump uh, using the limits key on the front panel and set a, a pressure that's lower than the one you need. Another possibility is the pump runs but will never reach the set pressure. This can occur from several possible sources. One, you may be pumping a fluid with a high compressibility such as a gas. The pumps really do best when pumping liquefied gases or liquids. Uh, also, you may have a, a major leak somewhere in your system or no restriction at all downstream in your experiment. So please check that. Or the third possibility is that the shear key may have been broken in the pump. And there is the procedure for checking that in the instruction manual. Also, another thing that may occur is you're getting, seeing some fluid leakage where the cylinder cap meets the cylinder. This can occur from either having a loose cap or the cylinder cap seal may have failed so and need replacing. Another thing one might find is fluid dripping from the drip pan on the rear of the pump or inside, actually found fluid inside the, on the worm gear inside the pump. This is occurs because of damaged or worn pump seals, and one needs to replace them as we detailed in a, earlier in this webinar. Another thing you may run across is an error message on the controller that says failure position and then a pump letter A, B, or C. There are several possibilities for why this might occur. One, it may simply be a temporary software issue, and resetting the controller as detailed in Technical Bulletin 9 will often clear this problem. Another possibility is that you may have worn brush, brushes on your motor, and they may need to be replaced. Another possibility is fuse number 101 on the motor board in a pump may be open, and you can check the instruction manual for uh, details on how to find and uh, check that fuse. Also, the tachometer sensor on the back of the motor may have failed. 
or we may have a limit sensor failure or actually a failed component on the motor drive board. Uh, for these types of uh, failures, you may wish to consult our technical service department for more help. Another type of message you may see on a pump occasionally is an overpressure pump A, B, or C. And of course, this means the pump has exceeded the pressure, uh, either the maximum pressure range of the pump or has exceeded this user limit that was set. Also, if you're using the 260, 500, or 1,000 milliliter capacity pumps, the pressure may have exceeded the maximum for the flow rate that you're trying to operate the pump at. There is a graph in section one of the instruction manual that shows the limits for the maximum flow rate at high pressures on these pumps. Also, additional troubleshooting tips can be found in Technical Bulletin 23. So, now moving on to the next section where we're going to talk a little bit about problem fluids or other applications with the, the pump. So, uh, one of the things that we're going to cover today, we're going to talk a little about low flow rate applications, about problems with pressure control issues, about using salt solutions or brines, and refill issues that can occur when you're working with either viscous fluids or supercritical fluids. So first, let's talk a little bit about low operating the pumps at very low flow rates. Low flow rates, when you're operating at those, sometimes you'll run into stability issues. Ways to improve this are, most important, is to provide a temperature control of both the pump cylinder and tubing using either uh, one of our uh, temperature control jackets or other means to make sure that your experiment, uh, all your pump stays at a constant temperature. Also, providing back pressure regulation of 500 PSI or more will help. And if you're operating below 100 PSI, you might want to consider using low pressure seals in your application. More information on low flow rate operation can be find in, found in technical bulletin number 10. Next, we'll talk a little bit about pressure control issues. One, if the pump runs and sounds like it's running, but doesn't actually move the piston up and down, this could occur because the shear key is broken. Uh, the details on how to replace the shear key are found in the instruction manual. Also, uh, the pump may fail the leak check, as we described earlier, that is in TB05, re requiring the replacement of either the seals or the cylinder cap. Another possibility is that the pressure may be somewhat inaccurate when compared to an external gauge. This may be due to incorrect calibration of the internal pressure transducer or the fact that the pressure transducer has drifted over time. Uh, and you can see the instruction manuals for detailed instructions on how to calibrate and zero the pressure transducer. But maybe the pressure readings actually vary greatly from the external gauge, or perhaps you are not able to actually even zero the, the, the pressure. So in this case, there may be several possibilities for this. We may have actually a failure of the pressure transducer, or there are a couple fuses in the pump that do uh, supply power to this. We fuse 102 and 104 that may be open. Or we may actually have a controller uh, failure. One of the quick ways to check this if you do have an extra uh, pump controller is to swap that out and see if the problem uh, stays with the pump or moves with the controller. Details on these types of troubleshooting are also in technical bulletin number 23. Now, when you want to work with salt solutions or brines, there are several things that can help here. One is to be sure you flush the cylinder out every time you're through with an experiment, uh, at least three times with distilled water. You may need to use a pump with optional Hastelay components if you're getting corrosion problems, or use and or use a pump equipped with a wash gland. The 500D and 1000D pumps the 1000D has the wash system as a standard, and the 500D has this available as an option. This provides a means to, to pump a small amount of wash fluid behind the piston to wash down the cylinder walls as the pump operates. More information on this topic is available in, in technical bulletin number four. So uh, next we want to talk a little bit about some pump filling issues, refilling issues. But first, we need to discuss how we need to measure the fill efficiency. To do that, basically what we're going to do is we fill the pump up and then bring it up to pressure to where it starts uh, flowing again. And we look at the volume at these two points. 
And we simply take the volume when the pump is back up to pressure remaining in the cylinder and divide that by the total cylinder volume to get this percentage of filling efficiency. Uh, if you're working with something like CO2, uh, 60 to 80 percent is considered acceptable uh, fills. For other fluids, this may actually approach 90 some percent. So uh, these things, the filling amount can be affected by the viscosity of the fluid that you're pumping, the temperature, or even the, uh, the supply tank if you're pumping like CO2 if it's becoming empty or low. So some of the things we can do to help if we're using a viscous fluid is, if we're possible, we can heat the fluid to, re to reduce its viscosity. Uh, standard pump cylinders can be operated up to 100 degrees C, uh, when with the optional high temperature package, you can actually operate a pump up cylinder uh, at a temperature up to 200 degrees C. You can also use larger diameter tubing or valves or pump caps with larger port sizes to reduce the restrictions to flow. You can use a pressurized reservoir, or commonly called a pressure pot, to help push the fluid into the pump, or use another low-cost pump to actually help supply the fluid to fill the syringe pump. So where are some of these typical choke points that we're, we're discussing here? Well, one is the sharp angles where the, actually the fluid exits the pump. Another is narrow diameters and sharp bends and tubing connected to the pumps externally. Another possibility is in the problems with the valves themselves and the path through those, or in the check valve that in a continuous flow system is used to keep uh, fluid from getting back into your reservoir, or even the line filter in your reservoir of fluid. So what are the, some of the things you can do to help with that? Well, we can provide caps with a 45 degree inlet and outlet port to minimize that uh, sharp bend, or in other cases, we can actually provide a custom cap that has a third vertical port to not have any bend at all in the fluid as it exits the pump or enters. We can also, it's good to use the largest available tubing that you can and be sure not to put any sharp bends in it. And in systems of this nature, it's best to use ball type valves that provide a minimum restriction to flow. Uh, more information on these types of things can be found in technical bulletin number 18. And in fact, we do actually have a, a system that we've developed that does incorporate all these changes uh, into a 500 HV, which is a 500 milliliter pump with 3 8 inch port sizes. And the ball, and also if you order this as a continuous flow system, it comes with 3 8 inch uh, ball valves, no inlet filter, and special software that uh, compensates for the fact that we don't have that uh, check valve on the inlet. Now, working with supercritical fluids creates some different challenges. Uh, obviously, compressing the CO2 generates heat, and we need to get that heat away from the pump so that the, to keep it below its critical point for, to get these best fills that we need. So the best way to do this is to use a temperature controlled jacket to remove this heat. Also, we want to make sure we don't heat the CO2 while it's in the pump. Uh, the pump could be overpressured as the fluid expands. Uh, details on this are in technical bulletin number eight. And here is a, a picture of, the, of course, the temperature controlled jacket. It is for zero to 100 degrees C operation. Uh, we typically recommend using it with a water bath, and uh, that water bath should be of a volume about twice the cylinder volume of your pump. And more information on, the, on this temperature control jacket is found in technical bulletin number seven. So in conclusion, pumps remain, uh, require just a minimum of maintenance. Most of this can easily be performed by the user. Uh, you can use our website, www.isco.com sp to keep updated on the latest information about our pumps. And our syringe pumps can be custom fit to many other applications. If you can't find an answer, call or email us with your special requirements. And again, more information and all the technical bulletins are found in our pump library at www.isco.com. And if you want to go to the S-P-A-P-P-N-O-T-E-S, uh, it will take you right to the page where all the apps notes are. Otherwise, there are links from the main page to get there. So, reviewing which technical bulletins would be pertinent to today's discussion, they are pumping salt solutions and brines, uh, TBO4, field verification, TBO5, uh, discussion of the temperature control jacket in TBO7, uh, applications and technical notes on using CO2, which is in TBO8, 
uh, how to reset the controller in TB09, uh, operating the pumps at low flow rates, which is covered, discussed in TB10, uh, pumping highly viscous fluids, which is discussed in TB18, uh, cylinder and system flushing and cleaning, which is discussed in TB21, uh, care and, general care and maintenance of your pump, which is in TB22, and the diagnostics and troubleshooting sections, which are in technical bulletin number 23. So for further questions or comments, you're welcome to com uh, contact either myself at the number or email address listed here, or Dale Clay, who is also his phone number and email address are listed on this slide. Okay, well, thank you again for attending today. And uh, this, as I mentioned earlier, this will, uh, webinar will be available on our website.